was a good uh, hymn to, to begin, that last one. Because it ties right in here to what we're going to be talking about right away. Okay, the mercy that never fails. Uh, we're on the Harmony of the Gospels, part 18 now. Part 18. I keep wondering how long it'll go on for. <laughs> Until we're finished, I guess. This one will start in Luke 7. <clears throat> Luke 7, and we'll start this one in verse 36. Luke 7, verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. And after going into the Pharisee's house, he sat down at the table. Okay. Uh, this Pharisee, was, his name is Simon. Why do you suppose this uh, Pharisee Simon invited Jesus into his house in the first place? Wasn't he having contention with the Pharisees? A lot of them. Not all of them. Some of them were curious about this man, Jesus. Wanted to know more about him. Um, they could see that he had authority, as a prophet would. <clears throat> and I suspect Simon invited... Uh, Jesus into his home because um, he was curious about the man. He wanted to know more. Uh, I don't think there was any evil intent on Simon's part in this act. And Jesus would have understood that too. And he went and he went to uh, to sit in his house to have you know conversation and you know, I'm sure food and whatnot. <clears throat> Simon probably wondered what sort of prophet Jesus was. Obviously he'd heard great things about him. Maybe he'd witnessed some of the things himself. And why, why do you suppose Jesus accepted the invitation to go there? You know, wasn't he sent to sinners? Yes, even Jesus himself said that. Did the Pharisees consider themselves sinners? They didn't really, did they? They were generally proud that they could uphold the letter of the law. Right? What they were guilty of, though, was breaking the spirit of the law, making the law a burden beyond what it was meant to be. <clears throat> So oh, imagine this time frame, okay, where you have this pharisaical view, right? Uh, the, the pharisaical view about themselves, for one, and the pharisaical view of the people in general about the Pharisees, right? This mindset where the Pharisees were supposed to be righteous, right? The people thought that. The Pharisees thought that. So this is the whole mindset to begin with, to, to set the stage on this thing here. <clears throat> in verse 37, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that he was sitting in the Pharisee's house, took an alabaster flask of ointment. Now here's another question. We'll pause here. How was the woman able to come into this Pharisee's house so easily anyway? wandering off the street and open the door and go in. Now, if you invite someone over to your house today, just any old person off the street just wander into your home? That doesn't happen, right? <clears throat> Apparently, back in, in this time, you know, everything was more open, not behind so many closed doors and locked doors. And when there was a gathering of many people, a banquet of some sort, there was a more of an open atmosphere and people could come close and you know, with doors open they could kind of listen in and check out who was there and you know listen to the conversation. Some would come in and talk with some of the guests and 
maybe ask questions. I mean, this is a kind of a atmosphere that was, was around at that time. It's kind of a foreign concept to us. That's not how our customs are at the moment, but it was, was here. So this, this uh, woman, you know, she didn't trespass, so to speak, into this man's house uninvited. <clears throat> There's precedent here. And she stood weeping behind him, Jesus, of course, and knelt at his feet and began to wash his feet with her tears and to wipe them with the hairs of her head. And she was ardently kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Why was this woman weeping? First of all, she heard that Jesus was in this Pharisee's house to begin with, and she went there with the purpose of obviously seeing him, and she got a flask of ointment. <clears throat> Why was she weeping, though? Possibly. I'm asking why she was weeping, though. Yeah. Was it the was it the woman with the blood issue? You're thinking. What were you thinking? Mary Magdalene, the very one that washed his feet. Um, possibly that that was Mary Magdalene, but not does, necessarily. Does, it does identify her as the one who washed his feet, anointed his feet. <clears throat> Say that specifically in this in this account. No, in that particular account. No, there is confusion because Mary Magdalene is mentioned in chapter eight, but it doesn't necessarily connect the two as the same women. Not necessarily. It, it's assumed that. It, it does not the scripture. It's quite clear that she was the one who anointed the Lord's feet. There could have be other other people that did that too. I don't want to dispute that one at the moment, okay? Because <clears throat> we'll, we'll get to all that stuff to begin with, all right? Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her to begin with, too. <clears throat> this woman was a sinner. If you have seven demons in you, I mean, there's, there's a whole different issue going on. Um, let's say a woman of the street Let's say a prostitute, for instance, too, has a different set of issues. You know, that would be that would be someone who, you know, everybody would know they're sick, right? So I'm just pointing this out that everybody knew who this woman was, right? She knew who she was, and she was weeping for a reason, and it wasn't. I mean, possibly because she was healed before. But for a much greater reason than that, much greater reason than, than just a simple healing, if, if that was even in the equation, okay? <clears throat> what else might she be weeping about then? Why would she come to the Lord? And in this state, and once she saw him, she's, she's, can you imagine her? She's weeping. And she's bowed down at his feet. And she's anointing his feet with oil and crying and, and drying his feet with, his, with her hair. What kind of state is she in? <clears throat> I would say she was in a repentant state. A repentant state. Not necessarily a grateful state. A repentant state. Hoping for something from Jesus. Right? By her actions, what can we conclude about her? Just from these little actions that we can see here. She had 
an outward sin that, she, that people knew about, that she was aware of, obviously. Right? Her sins were known publicly. She also knew to whom she was in the presence of. She knew. Which is curious that the Pharisees that were present didn't know. They thought he was a prophet, which he was, but which prophet? This woman had a better and greater understanding of who Jesus was, and you can tell by her actions that she knew that Jesus was the Lord. She knew this. And she was weeping because she knew of her sin. And she was desperate for her Savior to forgive her. It wasn't for a healing. She wasn't there for a healing. She wasn't there to say thank you for a healing necessarily either. She was there because she knew she was a sinner and she needed forgiveness. And she desperately wanted forgiveness. Verse 39. When he, which is Simon, saw this, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what the woman is who is touching him because she is a sinner. <clears throat> now, did Simon say this out loud or within himself? He said it within himself, didn't he? He's thinking it. Right? What can we conclude about Simon the Pharisee based about, on, on this? we can conclude that Simon was a sinner also, but inwardly it wasn't as evident as her. Right? He would have performed, say, the, the letter of the law as best as he possibly could, I'm sure, right? and didn't feel that he was guilty of breaking any of that. But there's the spirit of the law that he would have been totally unaware of. For instance, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her. You don't have to commit the act. That's the spirit of the law. Right? Did he do such things? Who knows? But he would have been guilty of the spirit of the law, breaking the spirit of the law in some way, shape, or form. Right? But was totally oblivious to that. Did not understand that. He was looking at her as a sinner and that Jesus shouldn't be allowing this woman to even be touching him because she's unclean. But he doesn't recognize his own sin. He doesn't see it. He therefore is unrepentant. Where she recognizes her sin and is desperate for forgiveness and understands who she's in the presence of, Simon the Pharisee does not understand any of this. He is unaware that he is a sinner. He is unaware of who is he in the presence of. He doesn't know who he's in the presence of. He doesn't even understand that he needs a savior himself. He doesn't understand that he requires forgiveness also. He doesn't get it. This woman gets it. He doesn't. And neither were those that were with him. They don't get that either. Because in their society, they're righteous, right? And the people are unrighteous. That's how they saw themselves. <clears throat> Verse 40. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Wait a minute, I thought Simon thought this inside. You know, it was, it was a thought, it was inward. But yet Jesus is answering him. We're speaking out. 
and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say on. If Simon didn't say anything, right, but he was thinking this, how did Jesus know what he was thinking? And feel compelled to comment on it. That was a sign that Jesus was a great prophet because he could read the minds of those who are sinners. He knows your mind. He knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knew what Simon was thinking. And he knew that Simon didn't understand what this woman understood. So he had to teach him. Which is another reason why Jesus came into this house in the first place. Is to be a witness to these Pharisees. That are spiritually blind. They don't get it. And these particular Pharisees, or Simon wasn't a, wasn't a man that wanted to kill Jesus, like some of these other Pharisees. Right? Jesus took the time to come to this man, to come into this man's house to teach him something and those around him. Something that they are spiritually blind to. Right? And this is what Jesus told him. <clears throat> there were two debtors of a certain creditor one owed 500 silver coins and the other 50. But when they did not have anything with which to pay him, he forgave them both. Tell me then, which of them will love him the most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave the most. Who he forgave the most. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. That's a simple little analogy. Right? It's a good teaching tool. But did Simon understand what the comparison was? No, not really. Right? Simon didn't understand the comparison that Simon was the man who owed 50, and the woman was the person who owed 500, and that the creditor was God, Jesus Christ. Simon didn't understand that, but that's what Jesus was putting across. Verse 44, and after turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not provide any water to wash my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You did not give me a kiss, but she, from the time I came in, has not ceased to ardently kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. For this cause I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, because she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, he loves little. Her sins were many. And she knew this. And she was in a repentant state. While Simon's sins were little. Comparatively. But we know that if you break one, you break them all. Right? He was un unaware and he remained unrepentant and unforgiven. <clears throat> you got to wonder where or what Simon was thinking in this. Like, why is he why is he telling me this? You know, he just he didn't get it. He didn't get it. And Christ said to her, "Your sins have been forgiven." He said this in the presence of Pharisees. Who can forgive sins? Can you forgive sins? Let's say someone sinned against you. Right? And people have. 
Can you forgive that person? Is your forgiveness enough for their salvation? Can you save that person because of No. You can forgive that person, and you should, right? For whatever has happened between you two, you must forgive. But that won't save them. Who forgives sin? Only God. God alone can forgive sins. And Jesus Christ was given the authority specifically to forgive sins. The Father gave that power to Jesus Christ to forgive sins. The Savior, the Messiah, the one to come, that prophet, right? Jesus declared that to her right there in the presence of those Pharisees. <clears throat> right? I just want to read it couple things from the Old Testament so that the Pharisees would have no excuse for knowing who this person was or who he claimed to be anyway. Um, in Psalm, Psalms 32, Psalms 32 verse 1, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whom, or in whose spirit, there is no guile, in whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, which is what we read in, or what we sang in, in the last song here. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And Isaiah 43. One more. Verse 25 of Isaiah 43. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare yourself that you may be justified. Only God blots out your sin. Only God has the authority and power to do so. And Christ said to this woman, your sins have been forgiven. Verse 49, what happens next? Then those who were sitting with him began to say within themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Who is this guy who claims he can forgive sins? The Pharisees knew that only God can forgive sins. So of course they would reason within themselves, who is this man? Who is he? Why does he put himself equal with God? How can he do this? You can understand their consternation, can't you? their confusion. And you can understand how some of them, who are the most extreme ones, would get so angry with them because they would see it as blasphemy, that this man is putting himself equal with God and can say that he can forgive sins. Who is this guy? You know, he needs to be dealt with. Verse 50, but he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. The Pharisees wouldn't have understood that either. The Pharisees wouldn't have understood that either. Why? 
by faith we trust in Christ. And when we trust in Christ by our faith, which we show in outward acts, like this woman did when she showed that she was repentant, right? right? God shows us mercy. When by faith we come to repentant to a repentant state, right? God grants us that. When He can see that our faith is such that He can grant repentance to us, then by His grace, which is freely given, it's the love of God, freely given, to forgive our sins, but it has a price. And that price is the bloodshed of God himself, Jesus Christ. It's not a free gift without cost. The cost was the life of Jesus Christ himself, God, who created mankind, who created this creation, who came to partake in this creation as a human being, to live a human life. To experience sorrows and pain and die. That was a great price. <clears throat> and you can only attain this by faith. By faith. You can't earn it by doing anything specific other than believing that Jesus Christ has the authority and the power to forgive your sins if you submit to him and you allow him to take that sacrifice for you. But what did the woman do? What did she do? She didn't have faith. Her faith was displayed physically with a physical act. That's what I'm saying. Christ. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Faith produces good works. Why was she weeping? Why was she weeping? Why did she fall down to her feet and there, kneel before him and pay such attention to his feet? If Simon knew her, why didn't he kick her out of the house? <clears throat> There's several reasons why. Because Jesus, one, Jesus one, Christ was there. Yeah, that's right, but she was pining over him. But when you look at... Uh, she wanted to see what, he wanted to see what Christ would do about her. Perhaps was yeah. his household. Yes. When you look at John 12, verse 3, the compatible uh, verses to this foot washing, the only two that are recorded in Luke and in John, it gives you much more, if indeed they are the same feast held in Christ's honor, it gives you much more of a, of a background uh, around this woman, perhaps her identity. In this particular instance, unless he had his feet washed twice, in this particular incident, it clearly identifies who was there. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, the disciples. And, and it goes hand in hand with, with what's in Luke. It's the only two recorded incidents of, of Christ having his feet water. And that identifies the woman. <clears throat> Looks like a different, um, different time frames, actually, though. So Jesus was anointed at Bethany. Yeah. In John uh, 12. Yeah, I can see that. <coughs> this was with his disciples, though. Yeah, but the other one is it's not mentioning it with the disciples, but it's also recorded by a disciple. Well, not a direct disciple, but it was recorded by Luke. By Luke. That's the only other reference that was recorded directly by a disciple, John. Yeah. Of a foot washing of Christ was that anointment at Bethany in, in 12. In 12. <clears throat> they, all, they all don't uh, record every detail. No, but it's the only no, two no. that ever mentioned he ever yeah. got his feet washed. There could be two incidences. I doubt two it. separate women. There could be. There could be. Right? Without more proof on that. Because this, this doesn't mention Simon the Pharisee in this at all. No. No. But in the other one, you look at the factors of her not being kicked out. It was indeed Mary and her brother who was well respected <clears throat> in the community. We later learn and find out that that was the case because of his death. 
There was picture of people of stature there even days after he was long buried. So Lazarus was well acclaimed in the community. If Mary was indeed his, his sister, she would have been somebody that, of course, being possessed, could have been capable of doing anything. This, this occurred, though, in um, Capernaum, where this was also, this was in Bethany, Bethany. the other one. But the, the, the account I'm talking about here is occurred in Capernaum at okay. a time earlier in the ministry. Well, I'll study for I'll, I'll yep. figure it. That's why the harmony of the Gospels is sometimes a little um, difficult. Because a lot of writers are pointing out that they're one and the same. There is there is confusion with that, right? And and there's disagreement with that, right? And and Mary Magdalene is mentioned in chapter eight of Luke, right? But it's in a different city too, right? Well, right further, fr further to that example of Luke, without getting into a, a long discussion about it, Christ couldn't read anybody's mind. He was a human being just like you and me. Mm -hmm. He could predict possibly the effects of human nature, having that higher level of understanding and that completeness in which the law did, did an act, especially along the spiritual lines. He knew who he was dealing with. We know that in every way he was just as human as the next guy. But God did speak through him. God did give him what to say. Mm -hmm. As in the case of, you know, who's on the coin. He gave him these answers. Absolutely. But... I mean, you're making a point about this, this woman. Who is, you're trying to identify this woman as Mary Magdalene? You're saying there's only two recorded incidences in the Bible of anointing of his feet. Yes. One's in Bethany and one's in Capernaum. Okay. Two, two, different, two different cities. Two different um, time frames in, in the ministry. Um, oh. Well, the, in this... Uh, how should we do this? Well, I'll look into it. We'll both look at it. Like I said, there's a lot of, the, the, the time, a lot of opinions yeah. to be for or against. No, I know, but the, the time frames that I'm in mm -hmm. with, the, with the harmony already yeah. were coming towards the fall feasts. This was six days before the Passover in Bethany. That's my point here, is yeah. that that's the yeah. spring festival, yeah. a different time, that's which right. could have been the following year. That's right. Right? That's my point, yeah. is that... In my journey through the harmony of the Gospels here, we're towards the fall festivals already, yeah. where this is Passover. Yeah. Right? I mean, but does it's it different. identify in Luke what time of the year it was? <clears throat> Specifically through, through around the, that through, feast? Through the different accounts, well, I'd have to go through, this, yeah, this is part 18 already. Work, yeah. But I know going through what I've been going through, with the different ones, I mean, we've gone through the Passover. In fact, we've gone through two Passovers. Yeah. And we've gone through two of them already. All right. You know, that apply in here. <clears throat> the important thing about Luke 7, what we've just covered, is not the identity of the woman. The identity of the woman doesn't matter. Who she is doesn't matter. It's her attitude is what matters. But see, what I'm she represented. You were saying that you got to forgive someone. No, you don't. When they're repentant towards you and apologetic, and they, they are not going to display that kind of behavior again, like forgiveness just doesn't come for free. I didn't say that. No, no, no. I'm saying in my own instance and walk as a Christian, I've had to approach that. It's no. not to critique you. It's something that I've had to approach myself, and I'm sure you have as well. And the conclusion that I've come up with from Scripture is, if somebody just, well, forgive me, forgive me. No. No. No, man. You have to be repentant. Uh, you have to follow the natural order of things. If it's your parents, you have to be respectful. You know, there's certain things that are there that have to be in place. And when they're not, there is no forgiveness. You're right. Absolutely. You're right. And that's, that's the same standard God expects. Yeah. Right? You have to respect the Father. If you're not in a constantly repentant attitude and state, your sins are not forgiven. That's right. So you and have to do something. Well, yes. And she was doing something. That's why I asked in the beginning, yeah. why was she weeping? That's right. She wasn't weeping because she was healed of anything 
physically. She was weeping because she knew she was a sinner and she needed forgiveness. And she knew to whom she was in the presence of. But Simon the Pharisee and the people in the house that were with him did not understand any of that. Not a scrap of it. The identity of the woman is, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who it is. Do you know the biggest lesson that I draw out of that, what you were talking about? Personally is, do I fit into the shoes of Simon? That's the problem in the churches of God today. Am I like Simon? Do I the, need to see something? Exactly. That's what, that's what I was going to nail home today, too, about that. Is This is the problem. The attitude of the Pharisees, right, where they're not guilty of sin. They're clean. That's their attitude. That's how they see themselves. More righteous. More righteous. The churches of God have that. And rightfully so, too, because if we are walking with Christ and we are in a repentant state, then we are not in sin. Sin is not imputed to us. We read this in, in the Old Testament here in, in, in um, Isaiah. It's not imputed to us. We're clean. Even though our sins are as red as scarlet, it will be white as snow and, and like wool. All right? But... You can get that Pharisaical, what uh, Jim once called, you know, the modern day Pharisee. Right? You can get to an attitude where you think you're a modern day Pharisee. I mean, you get to this modern day Pharisee type of a state, an attitude where you think you have no sin anymore, and you can look down at others and and condemn them because you can see what they're doing wrong, and, and your your take on how other people's lives are can be mis. I mean, you start judging others. Like take the beam out of your own eye first before you can get that speck out of someone else's. You know, you have to see that. And that's the entire point you know, that Jesus is making here. It's not, he's not just making this point to these Pharisees alone and, and to this woman who's before him, but for everybody else following. That's why it's recorded for us to see this, to be able to understand this. And just because you're in a, a state of repentance now and you are forgiven and there is no sin imputed on you now, right? It could all come back to you if you fall away, right? You can't do that. And just like, like you're, you have to forgive people, people that have done you wrong, you have to forgive them. There's got to be certain conditions, obviously. You know, I mean, the person has to, you know, show a, a state of repentance to you as well. But still, I mean, for your own spiritual goodness, health, and integrity, you can't let a root of bitterness come into your life. Let's say someone is is constantly causing you animosity, right? Uh, such the point you you just can't be around this person, right? You may never get along. You may never have uh, a common ground. You have to come to a level of forgiveness anyway where there is no root of bitterness that comes within your own heart, that starts corrupting your own heart. So you, you disconnect. You, 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 like the Bible instructs, you get away from them. You get away from them. You get away from them, yes, but your heart has to heal too. You have and to, it will, so long as it's not continually being provoked. You have, so you to, you, get away you, have to, you have to purge your own heart yeah. from, from any bitterness that you may have for anybody. Absolutely. Anybody. Right? Their state of forgiveness depends on their standing with Christ. Not their standing with you. Not their standing with you. They're standing with Christ. If their standing with you is good, their standing would be good with Christ. If they, are, if they have a problem with you or you have a problem with them, Christ, or God is not interested in your offering. I don't want it. Go make yourself right with your brother first. Then come back to me and it's acceptable. So if you are in an acceptable state with Christ, then that won't exist between your brother and you. But that's your brother. 
if you have someone that's in authority over you, an institute of you, God ordained as a natural order to be so, like my father, if I disrespect my father or my mother, I'm in the wrong, clearly. They have authority over me. And as long as they're doing what God, and trying to live a godly life, I can't go against them. The authority is there. That's not my brother. No, no, no. They have a higher standing and a higher, a higher classification in Christ's eyes. Honor your father and mother. It's a direct command. Absolutely. But let's say, if, if I'm not doing anything, if I'm doing something dishonorable with, yeah. my, with my children, yeah. they don't have to honor me at all. I don't, I'm not worthy of that honor. If I'm being dishonorable to them, they don't have to honor me. Right? There's a certain standard. I mean, you, I you have to. I know that you, the command was negotiable, Eric. I really do. You know? That's the spirit of the, of, of the law. It says honor your mother and father. Absolutely. Right? If, let's say, if, if my father beat me up, constantly beat me up, right? There'd be no honor there. You know? That wouldn't be up to Christ to judge that. Because you can look at biblical examples of things that were done that were very hurtful. In the case of Isaac, yeah, I, I, him, him choosing, I get that. Him choosing uh, uh, Esau over Jacob and making no bones about it and hurting this young man through that. Oh, I get that. I get that. Jacob still honored him, and he also, when you look at the abuse that Jacob suffered from Laban, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look at the definition of the word. You gotta look at the definition of the word honor, though. But you look at the example as well of those that yeah. have come before us, and if you look at the abuse that Laban gave to Jacob, I don't know if I can take that. And still have honored the same way that Jacob had for his father-in-law. Mm -hmm. He changed his wages three times. He used them. He lied to him and <laughs> served him up another daughter instead of the one that he betrothed to. He had to work another seven years. This man clearly ripped him off and screwed him around and caused him nothing but hardship. And that's disclosed finally when the two of them are meet face to face. Lovan is pursuing him. Why? He wants to rough him up. He yeah. wants to dominate him. Yeah. And Laban has a dream that night, and he's told, you be careful. Don't say anything good. Don't say anything bad. You be careful what you say to your son-in-law. And likewise with, uh, with Jacob. So you can see the, the inner workings of the family structure. You can see the decisions of those that walk before us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in the case of the parents or in the case of the in-laws or whoever it is that set up or institution, instituted above you in authority, be very careful if you're supposed to be subordinate because you're the one that's being judged. Because that's what the command points to. Yeah. It calls on you as a command to honor. Now I've honored even when I've been hurt. And I've honored when I've had crap thrown in my face because I felt it was the right thing to do. And the same thing with my parents before me. They honored their parents even though there was a lot of stuff and a lot of adversity there. Because they, they knew that it was the right thing to do. Hey, that was your dad. That was your mom. That's your father-in-law. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Same with her father. Her father's throwing all kinds of stuff in my face. Yeah. And I've always honored him. You know what I'm saying? As best I could. Not always, but I, I, I still <coughs> uh, yes. succumb. And I would apologize to him, and I would try to honor him. And I know you've been there yourself. Yes, I know. I, I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about. Right? But then, I mean, what's that definition of honor? What exactly does it entail? Is, is, is the point. Well, the, the, the opposite would give you the answer. No disrespect. Well, yeah, of course. No hatred. No malice. No. You shouldn't have any disrespect. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't have any disrespect for anybody. Especially publicly. Publicly, yes. I mean, I mean even um, St. Michael didn't accuse Satan. It's not for me, man. There's, there's, okay. there's someone else that's going to deal with that, and it's not me. Sorry. You know, as a Christian, you have to, you have to try to absolve every every strife between mankind. What you could possibly do, if you if you just honestly can't, and you've done whatever you can, right, then you can go to God, and God will accept your offer. Right? If, if, you've done, if you've done nothing, right, 
right? Now, avoiding a certain, you know, avoiding uh, anyone who you may have strife with may be necessary, right? But you have to do everything you can in your power to resolve a situation, especially if it's a brother, right? If it's someone in the world, right? You, you do what you can. You do what you can. You set that example. And, and you separate. You but leave. But 70 times 7 doesn't apply. No, I'm not saying that. No, no, I didn't say you no, said no, that. No, no. I'm just making a yep, statement. I'm not saying apply. that. But within your own heart. Yeah. You, right? know. you have to, you, it has to be gone from you. Yeah. It has to be gone from you. Otherwise, that root of bitterness comes in there. You, you know what helps with that? Because I've been there. Is you need to break it down to the lowest common denominator. And like Christ was doing with the debtors, like you're trying to point out, is that other person that maybe you're subordinate to or equal to or whatever, <clears throat> they've done things wrong, you've done things wrong. We've all but done things wrong. We've all done yeah. things wrong. But if they're in authority over you in, in a natural sense, a God-ordained sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like a father-in-law or whatever. The best way to do it is to break it down to its lowest common denominator. Have they given to you what they're obligated to give to you before God Almighty. In the case of Laban, yes. With the exception of the wages and anything that otherwise might be negated or need to be judged by God Almighty. God still blessed Jacob, right in the midst of Laban, even though he kind of still played the shell game with him, right? Yeah. At the same time though, Jacob held his counsel and did not cross that line of disrespecting his father-in-law, even though he had complete grounds to, because he was getting jerked around and his life was being turned <coughs> upside down by this man. He was still being provided a place to stay. He was still being provided a wage, although he had changed. He was still his father-in-law, and he was still within the confines of his home, or his homeland. So no disrespect was shown, and Laban had delivered to Jacob what he was obligated to. Uh -huh. When Jacob breaks that down and considers what, what was obligated to be given to him has been given to you. If your dad beat you, but he gave you a room he gave you food. He gave you the necessities of life. The beating is another issue that needs to be dealt with off to the side. Yeah. And it'll probably be between Jesus Christ and him. Not that that but ever he happened. he is a father. I know. That never you, happened. I know. I bet you can. Yeah. But he as a father has given you yeah. what he was obligated to give to you. <clears throat> just like Isaac gave to Esau and to, and to Jacob. He didn't have to love Jacob. Jacob didn't have to be his favorite. He gave him a home. He raised him, he fed him, and that was all he was obligated to do before God Almighty. With slight, with slight mitigating factors that came along much later when Paul said, parents don't frustrate your children. That was the only other advice that kind of created that counterbalance to honor your mother and father. And that was a part of the Mosaic law. So if, if, if you are subordinate, be very careful. And, 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 and at the same time, what you're calling for when it comes to bring about this disclosure is very important. And the only way you can do it is to look at those biblical examples for comfort and guidance in the conduct. I, yeah, I get that, and, that, and you are right in that, in that regard. Um, God uses physical examples to show spiritual truth. Yeah. And God is our Father. We must honor him, right? Because he's worthy of that honor. God is worthy of that honor. So we must honor Father, our Father, right? Our physical fathers, right? We must honor them too. Likewise, right? They need to be worthy of that honor, right? They, they do. They do. They need to show a godly example also. But there's nothing scripturally mediating uh, at all. I, I, I'm, I'm making a point. I know. I know what you're saying, right? If our physical fathers aren't honorable men, right, we still have to honor them yeah. right? Especially and not disrespect them, yeah. right? But they're not, they're not showing any, any outward signs of being honorable necessarily, but we still need to honor them and not disrespect them, of course, right? 
the physical is an example so that we can understand, because we can't understand things on a spiritual level like God can understand things. Right? This universe is expanding into what? I have no idea. Only God can know and, 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 and tell me. I have no idea how that works. I have no idea the inner workings of the atom specifically. I mean, my mind can't go there. There are certain things you just can't understand. So we have to use physical means, social means, interactions, our family, husbands and wives, you know, Christ and the church, and you know, to understand things properly, to, to be able to get through this life, to, to be able to know God, to be able to have a relationship with God. We have to have these human physical interactions and relationships, and these examples. And they test us. Yes, they do. Right? <clears throat> but still, I mean, God is honorable. Absolutely, God is honorable. He's the most honorable there is. No one else is more honorable than that. Right? You know, the Father and Jesus Christ, side by side, just like that. And they are worthy of that honor. Our human parents need to live up to that same example to their children and be honorable or worthy of honor. They need to be that way, right? But the children need to respect them anyway if they're not honorable, right? I mean, that's what God is showing us, right? And that's where there's this confusion with that fifth commandment, though. So you're I mean, saying that in spite of whether they're honorable or not, the commandment still needs to be obeyed, but the parents are still all in question <clears throat> and judged by you know, Christ. Well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I know it, what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, if the parents are not honorable at all and are totally despicable and at worst evil and commit atrocities like Hitler and Stalin and, and a bunch of these other, other creeps out there, their children, what, what kind of honor can they have to them? They're not even worthy of anything other than to die, right? But that's not the point. That's an extreme, right? Parents need to, to be able to be worthy of honor. I mean, they have to show that to their children. Otherwise, how are their children going to grow up to be honorable themselves? I know, but it still doesn't mitigate the commandment. No, no, I didn't say that ever. I mean, not, no, the commandment's not mitigated. But we're working within physical means to, that's our goal. to understand a spiritual truth. Yeah, our goal is to be like that. Our goal is to be like yeah. that, right? Yes. And and some of the worst relationships are within families, right? And that's it's the hardest thing to, to overcome and, and, and to learn. But that's the best way to learn, yes. to overcome, yes. is through family. And that's how it happens. That's right. you know? And we will get there. Right? And we all have to do our own individual parts. Right? But I, because I we're all held accountable only to Christ, absolutely. not to other people. But there are examples in the Bible of a family dynamic that is very ancient. These different dynamics have been around for a long time. And I find that there's comfort when you read them and you understand, oh, okay, favoritism perhaps in a family. And that's very hurtful. It's very hurtful to watch. It's very hurtful to be a, to be a victim of that, right? It, has a, it lasts a lifetime. I know that. But there are ways around it. If you look at Jacob, how he wasn't favored. Esau was the guy. And there was no bones made about it. No. You can get a lot of comfort and also a guide in your conduct to be able to handle it because he never disrespected Isaac. He came back into that land under peril of being killed by his brother to bury his father properly and to honor him. So mm -hmm. it just it helps when you have these different examples. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And it's good that we're here because we, we, we covered a lot of ground on Sorry, on, on this stuff, no, and actually, I was um, a bit worried about the the amount of material that I had. Where we can leave off now is actually perfect, right? Because I can, I wasn't sure whether I could get into this because it's it's this what we just covered today was a theme unto itself, and what we're going on to is something else. But you had a good yeah. point, Eric, when you were trying to bring about this comparison between Simon, this mindset, this yeast of the Pharisee, and us. Well, yes, the churches of God today. Yes, that's the whole problem. 
is that we can we can think that we're clean when we're not, <coughs> and I'm look I'm down at others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the problem. That's the danger in the churches of God today. Right. Because how do you start falling away? It's not suddenly. It's a gradual. Right. And a lot of times it happens because there's a root of bitterness in your heart that starts. And resentments. Right? And you can't allow that to happen. Right? What happens in your life between other people that you have in contact with, you can't allow it to poison your heart. It can't happen. Right? Because then you will fall into the way of the Pharisee. Right? And not recognize your own sin when it's coming. And that's the whole point. You know, Simon did not understand that. Neither did the Pharisees that were there. But did he ever get forgiveness? Uh, I'm not aware of that yet. I mean, no. Um, I'm not aware of that at the moment, that he actually understood that, that he ever did get to understand that. I'm, I'm not aware of that yet. I'm not finished with the Army of the Gospels yet, so, I mean, uh, I can't remember everything that I've ever read in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all this specific details of it, but I'm coming to it because that's the whole purpose of what we're doing. Right? <clears throat> but I want to finish with one scripture in, in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. It is by grace, which we know is a free gift of God, which is paid for by the blood of God, Jesus Christ that you have been saved through faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And this especially is not of your own selves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. All right. You're going to do good works, though, if you have the faith that is described and shown by this lady, this woman, wherever she is, we're not going to get into that, that part of it because that's not important. But we'll continue later. That's good for today.